125. Page 125. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. The last one now. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders and wonders of his love. Well, good to see you this morning. We're a little late starting. Let's bow in prayer. Brother Mike, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. You may be seated. A pessimist sees a dark tunnel. An optimist sees a light at the end of the tunnel. A realist sees a fright, a freight train. A train driver sees three idiots standing on the track. If someone from Holland married a Filipino, would their children be jalapenos? Oh, you need to smile because the lesson, I don't know what it'll do for you, but a good smile at first, at least you'll remember that, you know. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I want to talk to about Mary this morning. Uh, Brother West had some real good comments about Mary last week, uh, and we want to elaborate on that a little bit. It seems that there wouldn't be anybody associated with Christianity in any way that wouldn't be familiar with Mary. But if you go apart from the Christmas story, Mary is not a prominent figure at all, really, in the New Testament. She's a very young girl when we meet her. Some say that she's as young as 13. That's so hard to imagine, isn't it, that she's young as 13 or 14? Uh, but that's not just a few people that feel that way. She comes from the town of Nazareth, which is a rather poor town located on one of the major true routes, routes up in Galilee. Uh, Galilee is in the northern part of Israel. You may remember if you get your logistics right, Galilee is about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's down here, and you go straight up parallel to the River Jordan, and you get to the uh, Lake of Galilee, and Galilee's up that area, about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. This is where Mary's from. Not anything is really said about Mary's family. You know, it's kind of interesting. She just shows up on the scene, and we know a few things about her, but nothing about her parents or upbringing or anything. But a familiarity with the way she lived, with where she lived, and what we know of her in the New Testament would point to her being from a relatively poor family uh, as Jesus' mother. It's worth noting that Jesus' first advent will be one of humility in every way. He's God's son, but he's born in humble circumstances, and he's remaining that way till his time on earth. You know, I think, guys, that uh, in our day we live in, everybody's got, I remember, I remember the, and I'm not a great student of, of FDR or of the World War II necessarily a little bit, but I remember the phrase, a chicken on every table. You know, you're going to help everybody get that. And now we're trying to get a phone in every driveway, a cell phone in every year, uh, you know, whatever this, whatever that. Uh, Jesus didn't have all those conveniences, uh, but he did just fine. I think sometimes I hear about people dying because they don't have air conditioning. Man, that would have been true back when I was a kid. We'd all been dead. Uh, we had a, you remember Brother Gear? we had the attic fan. Did y'all ever hear attic fan? We had a window fan. You had a window fan? We didn't have much of an attic. Didn't have much of an attic. Well, ours was an attic fan, and when you flip the switch in the hall, it had these louvers. You switch it up, it'd open up, and the attic starts sucking air, and you'd open the window, suck the air through the house. And if you weren't careful, the dust would be going like this below the attic fan on the floor. I can remember that. Mom would get upset, but no. But we lived. We did just fine. You know, we had clothes, and we were warm, and we had food, and we were warm. I remember Daddy said, 
that uh, they lived down in the woods in East Texas. He said they didn't know they were poor till somebody came through and told them. They, they were just happy. So a lot of times we put too much on that. Jesus was born in very humble circumstances. Somebody said this, it's well in our day that we be reminded often of the lowly common circumstances that Jesus, the apostles, and most of the early New Testament Christians lived in. Much of Jesus' teaching was to the poor and regarding the poor. We might do well to rethink our view of wealth in the society we live in today, especially among the Christian community. Wealth is, for the most part, a distraction from deeply devoted Christianity. Uh, it's, I believe that's true. Well, Jesus had none of that. Mary had none of that. That's not where Mary came from. Uh, Mary's story can be found in the greatest detail in the first two chapters of Luke. In the first verse, where we meet Mary, we immediately find out three things about her in Luke chapter 1. We find out, number one, that she's a virgin. We find out she's a spouse to a man by the name of Joseph. And we find out that one of the two angels mentioned in the Bible is appearing to her and speaking to her. The fact that, and talk about those three things. The fact that she's a virgin is of utmost importance. I thought Wes's excellent was ex, or message was excellent on Wednesday night talking about the reason that Mary needed to be a virgin. It's not okay if you believe she wasn't a virgin because it wouldn't be God's son. So the fact that she's a virgin is of utmost importance. The, the, this would be required for the one who was to bear the sinless son of God. Uh, how sad in our day that virgins are made fun of and even Hollywood movies made to mock them. You know what I'm talking about. You probably heard the titles of the movies uh, that are made to mark somebody that's a virgin. That alone ought to demonstrate for us the da vast difference between the world and God's ways. God's ways and the world's ways to make light of a sin that's plainly uh, in the Bible plainly taught. Well, okay, she's a virgin, she's of most of significance. We found out that she was espoused to Joseph, and it brings to our attention a custom that we in America are not familiar with. Another term for the word was to be betrothed to somebody. A betrothal period was much like an engagement period, but it was a lot more serious. You give her that engagement ring, but this is real serious. It's real close to being married. Uh, the two had been promised each other in the presence of witnesses, and some say that the period customarily lasted for a year. So you must have had some guys with a lot more patience back then than you've got nowadays because the common period was a year that it lasted. Well, the third thing in that verse you find out, Gabriel is appearing to her with a message from God. It has constantly appeared or, or, or came to my mind in the Bible so I said, well, I'd like to be a Moses. Well, I'd like to be a Daniel or I'd like to be a, a Apostle Paul or I would like to be somebody like that. Hey, man, just to be mentioned by somebody like that is quite an honor. Uh, to have the angel Gabriel talk to you, there's only two named angels in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael, uh, and that Gabriel uh, spoke to her was an amazing thing. He's appearing to her with a message from God, which is amazing in itself. At the time this happened, words from God and appearances from angels had been few and far between in Israel for many years, much less it happened to a girl this age. I mean, you're talking about coming off the 400 silent years, which is referred to between the Old Testament and the New Testament, where there were very few, if any, revelations from God. Well, this is where it starts back. It starts out with this angel appearing to her. I want you to read with me what he says. It's Luke chapter 1. Verse 28 to 38. Luke chapter 1, verse 28 to 38. It says, An angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of greeting or salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And I'm going to stop there a minute. What did he say that, that she had found favor with God? Well, I was listening on the other day on the TV, and if you found favor with God, that meant you were going to get a new car, and it meant you were going to get a house and all that type of stuff. But that's not what he's talking about here. He said she found favor with God, but it went totally the different way. He said, the Lord's with you. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She cast in her mind what manner of salutation this ought to be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb 
and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this thing be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So the angel first appears to Mary, and she's startled, and she experiences momentary fright. I'm always amazed at some of the songs I hear and all, and they talk about being buddies with Jesus, and uh, when you meet Jesus, you're, you're going to be a, a chum to him. I don't think it's that way. Oh, he loves you so much, and you're so accepted in the beloved, but he's so glorious that it won't be a chummy, chummy relationship. It'll be a relationship of just amazement and awe. It'll be an amazing thing. Well, she's startled, and she's frightened a little bit. Why? Well, in all possibility, uh, because she was a woman of such a young and excellent moral character, she's still a sinner. She's now unexpectedly face-to-face -face with a strong, brilliant, sinless being. She saw the angel Gabriel, and he began to talk to her. So what did he tell her? He told her this. He told her she was highly favored or she was much graced in the sight of God. He tells her that she's blessed among women. Well, it was considered a blessed, great blessing in her day just to bear a son at all and a disgrace to be childless. Well, how much more blessed to bear the only begotten Son of God. So she's blessed, he says, above all women, and she's highly favored. This, this birth that's fixing to take place and she's fixing to be the mother. This is no afterthought on God's part of the way he wants to do things. It's no sudden innovative idea of how to pay the great sin debt to, <clears throat> for it to dawn on God that, that, hey, it would be a good idea to take a virgin girl and let her have a baby and it be the son of God. That didn't just dawn on God. You know, Brother Thrift used to say, did it ever dawn on you that nothing ever dawned on God? God knew this for a long time. He, he had, this was no sudden idea. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, according to the apostle John. The announcement had been scheduled for thousands of years. This is, and, and you think about that. God's plan was if Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, this was in God's plan from eternity past for all these years. So it's something that's going to happen that's just waiting on something to happen. I'm always looking when somebody gives me an announcement of something that's going to happen. I'm going, okay, when do we start? On Monday? <laughs> it doesn't usually start on Monday. It may be for something way out or whatever. And it seems like most of God's announcements are like that. They're not for right now. And he wants to know whether you believe him and you'll trust him because it's something uh, for the future. So it had been scheduled for thousands of years. I wondered the angels get excited. I don't know much about angels. Most of those pictures look pretty stoic. But I wonder the angels get excited. It might have been very exciting for Gabriel to deliver this message announcing the actual playing out of the most significant event ever to take place on God's earth. This event would ultimately provide for God to bring his straying children back in fellowship with him. So this, this is a big announcement. Maybe Gabriel considered it a great privilege to be the one to go down and do that and had been waiting to be dispatched on this mission for a long time. I'm using that word dispatched. I remember at my daddy's funeral, uh, Brett Jones was making an allusion about, if you ever knew my dad, dad would, uh, until he, he died when he was 74, but he dispatched the day before he died. Dad, dad had a high back chair. And Dad would roll it into our dispatch office. And at the dispatch office, you've got a board there. And it's got all these pending road calls you've got to go on and, and who you're going to put on the call and when they get to the call and when they finish. And I'm talking about any given time, there may be 20 or 30 road calls moving across that board. Well, Dad, Dad would roll his chair in there and he'd tell the person, get up. He'd say, find out which one of those calls you're going to take. I'm dispatching. And Bobby would grab a call and he'd get out of there. <laughs> Daddy would sit down and start dispatching. And man, he was good. He could sit, he could visit with you about cows. 
and listen to that radio and that phone dispatch those trucks like anything else. So I, and, and Brent was alluding to something like that uh, at Dad's funeral. Wonder who the dispatcher is in heaven. Wonder if Gabriel's just waiting. He's just waiting to be dispatched. Some of these other guys got dispatches that might not have been so pleasant. But Gabriel's just waiting to be dispatched to take that call to go to Mary to tell her it's time now. 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. Nothing much <laughs> happening. But to tell her that this is the time, the fullness of times that God's bringing his son into the world. Wonder if Gabriel was just waiting for that dispatch and he was ready to go. He wouldn't have needed a vehicle full of gas, that's for sure, because he didn't need a vehicle at all. Well, he tells Mary that she'll conceive in her womb and bring forth a son. It's the first thing he tells her. He gives Mary the name that's to be given to him. And then he gives Mary a short description of who he'll be. Look in verse 32 and verse 33 where we read. It said, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus is an eternal king. Of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is what Gabriel is telling Mary and letting her know. Well, of course, Mary can't understand this. I'm amazed, and you don't have to confess, but I'll confess for all of us. I'm amazed at how I read the Bible, and I just read through things, and I know they happen, but I don't picture the magnitude of what's going on. And probably one of the greatest examples, you've heard me say this a lot of times, one of the greatest examples was uh, watching Charlton Heston play Moses in the Ten Commandments. When I saw the Red Sea part, I thought, that's what it looked like? That's cool, man. And I don't know if they did it just right. Hollywood usually doesn't. But you put that stuff in your mind and you, you get the magnitude of it. Some of the numbers of soldiers you read in the Bible are just something you can't imagine. But here, this is happening to her. This is happening to her. She's going to conceive in her womb and bring forth God's son. He gives her the name, gives a short description of what he's going to be like, like he does here. And Mary can't understand it. She, uh, conceiving a child as a virgin without ever having known a man was unheard by anyone. Nobody had ever heard of anything like that. And as some say, it had never been before mentioned. I, I say that, except in Isaiah, but a lot of them didn't understand that prophecy. Other than that, it had not been mentioned. But in verse 35, Gabriel gives more concerning how this is happening. This, in verse 35 is a great verse. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. Gabriel's going to explain to her how this is going to happen, that God is going to come to her and his presence overshadow her and she'll have God's child in her womb. Well, as if to help Mary believe, Gabriel goes on to tell her about her cousin Elizabeth who's gotten pregnant herself at an age that's well past childbearing. And to put both events into perspective, he says in <clears throat> verse 7 after he tells her about, Mary, about Elizabeth too, he says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. He says, you're going to be the mother of a virgin-born child of God. Your cousin Elizabeth is well past childbearing age. But he said, I don't want you to doubt that. He said, for uh, nothing's impossible with God. Not anything's impossible with God. Have you thought about this? Only God can create life. Man can't even produce a sperm and an egg in a scientific lab that can germinate and produce life. Only God can produce life. Man can only experiment and manipulate things that God's already created. Uh, but not only can God alone only create life, God can create life out of nothing. You've got to remember he created Adam and Eve out of nothing. Adam out of nothing, Eve out of Adam's rib. So God created Adam out of nothing. Uh, he can also do it with only one person, as in the case of Mary, if that's what he chooses to do. Let me ask you this. He makes a statement with God, nothing's impossible. What situation's been on your mind lately that you felt that God could not change? Well, do you feel that anything's impossible with God? Can you got Isaiah back prophesying in Isaiah 7, 14, that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son? You've got others uh, prophesying the Son of God. You've got the Old Testament years rolling on and rolling on, and that doesn't happen. Then the last writer, Malachi, comes along, and everything goes quiet for 400 years, and nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Uh, 
And you say, man, this is, is this ever going to happen? They say in the last days there will be scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? A lot of time goes by, but you can't measure it with time. And if you feel like, if God's told you something in his word, you know that's true. And if you feel like God's told you something, you need to hang on to it. What impossible situation has been on your mind uh, that you need? And do you feel that it's impossible with God? If you do, you need to rethink it. Because he says nothing is impossible with God. Well, Mary's response is, is really wonderful. <laughs> it's glorifying to God. Her love and her devotion and her confidence in God is all expressed in the short phrase she makes. She says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. That's what we ought to be able to say. Behold the servant of the Lord, be it unto me coming to thy, according to thy word, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Mary's willing to give her body, uh, like he said in Romans chapter 1, submit our bodies to the will of God. Mary's willing to give everything, soul, body, everything to the Lord. Wonder if she had plans. I, I, I'm not a lady, but I, it seems that most ladies have real plans when they're getting married and they can see the future a little bit and have plans. All those change right here. All those change right here, but that's fine with her. If it's for God, that's fine with her. She's happy to do it. Mary's blessed among women, and that can't ever be denied. But if a person is for looking for the blessing of God along with the ease and favor of the world, they're probably going to be disappointed. If you're looking for the presence of God, the blessing of God with the ease and favor of the world, you're probably going to be sorely disappointed. It's worth noting what Mary's going to face in a time of head, a time of head. Now she is blessed of God. But Mary's betrothed husband is going to find that she's with child. And how is he going to understood and be, understand and be able to believe with this the way she explains it? Fortunately, God took care of this and revealed to Joseph what he was doing in a dream. But how about that short period of time between the time she told him and the time that God appeared to him in a dream? Can you imagine? She had been gone six months uh, to see Mary and she comes back and now she is really showing and Joseph looks at his spouse bride and he goes, what in the world is going on here? That wasn't a pleasant thing for Mary, I'm sure. Not only that, she's going to be exposed to painful criticism and ridicule in public for being with child before she's married. Can you imagine how her explanation of being pregnant went along in society that day? Society doesn't buy anything like that nowadays, especially nothing concerning God. So she had this to, to look forward to. She's bearing the Son of God, which is a wonderful thing, but she's in this world, and, and right now, she's looked down on. She's looked down on, and nobody understands what's happening. To accomplish the prophecy of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, not only that, she's going to have to travel to Mary because Augustus Caesar said that everybody had to go to their hometown to be taxed, and she's going to be on a trip to Bethlehem during the final days of her pregnancy, and she's going to be caused to deliver in a cattle barn. Now, again, I've never been a woman, and for this case, I'm glad that I'm a man. But, man, can you imagine being pregnant, ladies, and traveling your last few days on a donkey or on a cart uh, into Bethlehem and then having to give birth uh, in a cattle stall? She's blessed among women, but it goes with these other things. No one would have ever dreamed that God would have his son come into the world under circumstances like that. You'd have never thought that that would be the way that that would happen. You remember the song that we hear so much now, how should a king come? And they talk about how a royal king would come, and yet that's not how Jesus came. I want you to look at Simeon's words in chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. She went in the temple, chapter 2, 34 and 35. She went in the temple, and there was an old prophet, and there was an old prophetess that had been waiting to see the Messiah. And when Simeon saw the Messiah, he told Mary this, verse 34, Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He's trying to explain to her some things that will be coming down the pike that are not going to be pleasant for her. Let me read you what William Hendrickson said about this. Simeon spoke to Mary words that must have startled her. He told her that her child would become a great divider, not, however, that events would simply turn out that way, but that in God's plan it had been so decided. 
Lucifer, excuse me, literally, what he said was, quote, Mark well, this child is set for the falling and rising of many in Israel. In other words, a person's relation or attitude toward Jesus would be absolutely decisive of his eternal destiny. Some would reject him. Others would, by sovereign grace, accept him. The former would fall. That is, they would, unless they repented, be excluded from the kingdom. The latter would rise. That is, they would be welcome into the kingdom at its wedding feast. Even in Israel, in spite of all its advantages, there would be this sharp division between those who reject Jesus, a vast majority, and those who welcome and embrace him. Wonderful time for Mary, but this is how the life of Christ is going to play out, her son. In claiming this close relationship to his heavenly father, he's going to be spoken against. He's going to be contradicted, the verse says here. By means of their attitude to Jesus, men would be constantly revealing the thoughts and deliberations of their heart. They would show whether they were for or against him. Listen to this statement. Neutrality would be forever impossible. In parenthesis, Simeon, in addressing Mary, states that a sword would pierce her soul. In fact, as the original indicates, a large and broad sword, the symbol of intense pain, of frightful and piercing anguish, is what he's speaking of. Is it not possible that the very memory of Simeon's Simeon's prophecy strengthened Mary in the moments of her deepest agony, proving to her that this was included in God's plan and would therefore work together for good? Best of all, because of the resurrection on the third day, Mary's sorrow would subsequently be turned and changed to rejoicing and strengthening of faith. What he's saying here, it's a great thing that Simeon told her this before it came to pass. Remember the night I got saved, and you guys have heard me say this in my testimony. I went over to look up Brother Mark, knocked on his door, he came to the door, I told him I got saved, and he told me this. He said, if you're really serious with God and, the battle, and, and you're really saved, The battle is not over, it's just starting. He said, the devil's going to give you all he can to try to stumble you up in your Christian life, but you just need to be ready and remember God's with you and God loves you. Well, that helped me because when the times came, I wasn't surprised. I knew it was coming. This is what kind of happened with Mary. Uh, What Simeon said to her made her ready, and as she began to see these things come to pass, it just verified what she already knew, that he was the son of God. It's true that Mary faced much heartache, but the things she experienced in the years after she gave birth to Jesus only confirmed Gabriel's announcement that he was the son of the highest. Well, when God sent the shepherds to see the baby Jesus, and they told their story of how the angels had announced his birth, the Bible says Mary kept it and she pondered it in her heart. She thought about what that meant. When she and Joseph went to the temple and the old prophet Simeon found them, and spoke about how God had revealed to him that their baby was the Messiah and how he had waited to see him before he died. I'm sure Mary just thought about that and pondered it in her heart, what that really meant. When at the same time in the temple, the old prophet Anna worshipped him, and, and Simeon, just like Simeon did, I'm sure Mary took note of that and just pondered in her heart. Have you ever seen things like that? Maybe you've been told something was come to pass. And as it began to come to pass step by step, man, you're just looking at it and you're just pondering it in your heart. You're just thinking, man, this is just the way they said it would be. There's some real significance to this. This is the way Mary was seeing things. She has no control. She has no power. But she's seeing God's plan work through this child that God's used her body to bring to this world. Jesus grew up physically in her home. And she and Joseph gave birth to other children. After Jesus was born, they had four more sons and two daughters. You'll know Jude and James are writers in the New Testament. They followed Jesus after he died, after he was crucified. They became followers of Christ. But they had had four of the sons and two daughters. How she must have seen something different in Jesus as the other six had a sin nature. But this is the only one, this one, the Son of God, that had no sin and lived perfectly. How many of y'all have had perfect kids? How many of y'all are blind? (laughs) How many of you were perfect kids? Maybe that would be a better question. Surely each of the others at some time or another must have apologized to their mother for attitudes they had displayed or for things they should have done or things they shouldn't have done. But this one, the son of the highest, never needed to apologize for he never disrespected his mother or he never sinned in any way. The long years of childhood, that's kind of hard to picture sometimes, isn't it, that that could be that way, but it was. Jesus was the sinless son of God, and he never had to apologize to his mother for anything. After 30 years of growing, 
in this human body God had put him in, Jesus began his ministry proclaiming himself to be who he was, the Messiah, the Son of God. Well, Mary was there. She saw that. She was there when he performed the first miracle at the wedding of Cana. She saw this son, the Son of God, perform that miracle when he turned the water into wine there. Although she was not there most of the time, Mary followed him throughout his ministry. How she must have come to know over those years how little that she had to do with who Jesus was and how fully God had come to earth in the person of Jesus. Man, she should have had, and who knows about those other boys and those two daughters. She should have had, could have had some great kids, but this one was different. This wasn't just a normal child. This was God's son, and she's witnessing it, and she's seeing it. And it's amazing that uh, his brothers so saw it that later on they followed Jesus and called him Lord and Savior, not just brother, or not just half-brother, but Lord and Savior. Well, Mary was at the cross when Jesus died. This was when the sword pierced her soul the greatest is when she saw her son crucified on the cross. But she was there for the resurrection too. She's also there with the disciples when the Holy Spirit came and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was born. She was there then. Mary was totally human and in no part divine. Okay? She's totally human and no part divine. She was just a chosen vessel of God used to bring his son into the world. And what a privilege that would be. I want to give you three things, and I'll be finished real quickly, uh, that come to mind when you're talking about Mary. And the first one I want to tell you is this. They're on your sheet. God's plans are known only unto him. God's plans are known only unto him. We only find out God's plans progressively. Day by day is how we find out God's plans. We walk and we see what happens today and what happens tomorrow, and we begin to realize how God's working out his plans. All Israel knew that a Messiah would come, but they didn't fashion him coming the way he did, nor did they fashion him living the servant life and dying like he did. God knew that, but men didn't knew that, didn't know that. Have you ever been astounded, you know, when they're talking about Jesus and that he's the carpenter's son, and somebody says, but we know that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but nobody took the time to find out that he was born in Bethlehem. That's exactly where he was born. But... God's plans are only none to him. Man is startled to learn, uh, was startled to learn that she would give birth to the Son of God. But Mary only experienced what it would really mean as the years go by. God knew, but she didn't know what it would mean to Mary because only God's plans are known to him. God set you off on a journey, and if God showed you everything that was on that journey ahead, it'd scare you half to death. But he doesn't do that. Day by day, the promise reads, daily strength for daily needs. Cast foreboding fears away. Take the manna of today. It's day by day the way God shows us. Look at the second thing. It's this, that God's ways are not our ways. The verse in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, just stands out above things in a magnificent way. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And God's not putting down your thoughts. He's just explaining the vast difference in capacity that you have and he has. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I was thinking this. I, I tell you sometimes at the company, we'll have a monthly meeting, and there's the regional supervisors, and everybody's there. And, and you'll come in, and you'll say, hey, we need to do this. And we do need to do this, and we're going to do this. We need to do this. But as it starts around the room, somebody says, well, if we're going to do it, we need to do it this way. And say I'm the guy that came in and started the conversation. I go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. And then this other guy over here say, but if we're going to do that, we're going to have to do this too. And I go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. And the one down at the end says, well, would it be better if we did this? And I go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. And just people that are coming up with ideas and things to make things better that are helping you. I tell people, you know, folk, a lot of folks want to tell people what to do. Man, I don't want to be responsible for your life. You ain't going to get me to tell you what to do. I would have in the past. That was when I was stupider than I am now. See, I didn't say I'm not still stupid, but I don't want responsibility for your life. I don't want to run your life. The idea is to get somebody to think it through. But uh, ways that come that are better. Well, can you imagine if God's sitting at the table and you bring something? God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. If somebody else can can improve your thoughts. What can God do? God sees way in the future 
And God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. You say, well, but that makes me feel bad. It shouldn't make you feel bad. The idea is we seek the Lord and we find out those things and we get to live out those higher thoughts and those higher things and they get to be part of our life if we submit ourselves. His ways are not our ways. The virgin maid, the suffering Messiah, these are God's ways. They're God's ways, not man's ways. They never saw that. While Jesus was living, they were waiting for him. They were waiting for him to take over, but that was not God's way. The saint who follows the Lord will be constantly surprised. I want you to think about that. The saint who follows the Lord will be constantly surprised. We pray, but God often works and answers that we never and answers in ways we never imagined. You remember the soldier that quoted to Napoleon, he said, God disposes, but man, God proposes, but man disposes, and Napoleon corrected him. He said, No, Napoleon proposes and Napoleon disposes. Do you remember what happened? I think it was the next day. Waterloo happened the next day. No, God, God works out his plans and his ways aren't our ways and we can constantly be surprised. If you're submissive to the will of God and you want to know the will of God, you'll constantly be surprised how God does things so much better than you do. Now, I remember Garth Brooks singing that song I don't know all his songs. One good song that he sang. Uh, Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer. You remember that song he used to sing? He's talking about a girl he wanted to be married to, and he begged the Lord to give him this girl, to give him this girl. Well, God didn't give him to her, and he had another lady later for him to marry. And the, the, the chorus of the song said, "Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayer." I remember the first time I ever heard that song. I, song I thought a lot of times I have thanked God for unanswered prayer. I thought that this was the way. And I thought this would be good. Didn't turn out that way at all. I'll tell you, and I think I've got them in. I'm, I'm on my last point. I thought that when the Bible talks about one world government, it would be communism. Never saw the Berlin Wall falling in the USR breakup. Never saw it. Never imagined it in my mind. I had no clue how the world was going to get united. But you know how I think it's going to get united now, guys? I, I read a couple of books lately on uh, end times and prophecy. I think economic problems is what's going to bring the world together. I've been reading a book about the similarities between Nazi Germany and the United States, and they talked about how Hitler, the economy in Germany, was terrible after World War I. The reparation uh, charges they put on Germany, they couldn't pay. It was bad. But Hitler, within five to seven years, turned it all around, and everything was going right, great. And as a consequence, people were willing to give up freedoms, give up liberties or whatever to have enough money to live on and have a pleasant and a comfortable life. And we've got a nation now, you want to prove how truly global it is? This environmental pandemic has been amazing how global that it is, how the global uh, voice and the global uh, uh, statistics and everything about it is on a global basis. And the economy of government shutting down has been something else. They're talking about doing second rounds of shutdowns where it's real bad and all. And the economy's really hurting. Countries are printing money that they have nothing to back up. They're just printing money and all. We're headed for an economic crisis at some day and that could largely be the thing that brings people together under the Antichrist. So I never saw that coming. I didn't either. Uh, a Christian will be surprised. A saint will be surprised when he sees God do things in ways you never thought of before. Let me give you the third thing, the last. God uses human vessels. God uses human vessels. Sometimes God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But most often, even then, he has a human raise a rod or be involved in some other way. Mary was used of God. How humble she must have felt, how honored she must have felt. God sent his son, the second member of the Trinity, to be conceived in her womb. God let his son be raised in her home. God uses human vessels. God uses human people. You say, how does God want to do his work? He wants to do it through you and I and other children of God, people that is other children. And the question I want to leave you with is this. Wonder what God might want to do with me. Wonder what God might want to do with me. Well, you say, Bob, it's getting kind of late in the game, isn't it? You're 65. Some of us are older than that. Some of us aren't far behind you. It's getting kind of late in the game. Hey, it's never too late in the game. It's never too late in the game. 
God's living in you. God loves you. If you're saved, God's working in your life if you're saved. And you don't know what God might want to do with you. You may have it planned. You may think that you can see all the possibilities, but you can't see anything. You think you can. You think you can, but you can't. And God's got a vision and God's got ideas that are totally different. Now the plan is going to happen. The outcome is written down. But how you get there is totally up to God and how he takes us there. So we need to be sensitive to the Lord and how he might want us to be. Somebody said, I was reading Erwin Lutzer last night, and he said, he made the remark that somebody was talking about how bad of a day that we lived in. And he said, no, it's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day to be living in. He said, we can go to church and go to the house of God. We can preach. We can gather here this Sunday. Nobody's going to bother us. Wes will preach in a few minutes what God's laid on his heart. That's no problem right now for him to do that. We can witness to people, work, and live our lives in basic peace. I understand there's problems on the horizon. There's been problems in the past. But it's a wonderful day to serve the Lord. And we need to just be asking God, Lord, what do you want to do with me today where I could be part of what you're doing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the story of Mary, Father. Lord, she was not divine or the mother of God, but she was certainly the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, and you used her life. And Father, all she had to say was that let it be according to your will, Lord, with her and her life and her body. Lord, help us to be that way. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to pray the things we really need to pray not worrying about how you'll accomplish them, Lord, and not limiting you in our mind, but to pray the things that we need to pray to see your will done on this earth, Father. Use us, I pray. Make us salt and light. And I pray for each one of us this week that you'd put somebody in our path and put us in a position, Father, where we have to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and speak, have to speak of the hope that's within us, God. Give us the words to say and help us to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.